I am going to be talking about politics and board games. Um, actually, I'm going to be talking about board games and politics. Board games and politics. Board games and politics. Now, you might think these are two things that have got nothing to do with each other, like artichokes and, say, wigwams, or diagrams of submarines and venereal disease, but I'm going to convince you otherwise. <laughs> And the best way to start off any PowerPoint presentation is with a clever quote. So, here's George Orwell, he said, The opinion of art should have nothing to do with politics, is itself a political attitude. Hmm. Nice one, George. Um, I'm not going to argue that board games are a kind of art form, because actually I think they're much better than art. So this quote needs some tweaking. And I don't, there's no record that George Orwell ever played a board game, but I reckon if he was around now, he would have said the opinion that games should have nothing to do with politics as itself and political attitude. But even if he was, he can't, because I got there first. <laughs> <laughs> and it took me a good week to go. So I appreciate that. That is a clever quote, right? Now it's been tweaked. Nice one, Ben Bailey. <laughs> I've always been interested in board games and politics, as you can see from this prototype. This was a game I made when I was at sixth form. This is a board game called Ideology. The idea is simple one player is a communist and one player is a fascist. You can build up a political party with real life people. So you've got Karl Marx, Lenin, Che Guevara, Vinnie Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Why he's in there, I can't remember. It's a bit random. But the game was kind of flawed because I'd rated the cards based on what I thought at the time. So well, there was no attempt to balance it. So communist victory was kind of more or less built into the game. <laughs> Admittedly, Hitler's got some pretty good stats. Yeah, 10, 10, ultra leadership. But if it's got idiots like Ronald McDonald let me side down. So basically, the red team always wins which is maybe cathartic, um, perhaps, but it doesn't really make for a good game. However, there are loads of published games in which certain assumptions are embedded in the rules. You don't need to look far, for examples. When most people think of board games, think of Monopoly, when most people think of Monopoly, they think of endless, tedious hours, locked in an unbreakable loop of frustration, <laughs> disappointment, mild anxiety, occasional moments of gleeful revenge, more disappointment. And the unnerving experience of watching family members turning into ruthless money grubbing bastards. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've been there, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> you've all been there. This is a game that's so effective at inducing a frenzied state of greed that most players end up begrudging their mates a 10 quid birthday present, <laughs> even when they're in half of London. So it's fair to say there's something a little bit political going on here. So get them when they're young, right? That's the motto. Um, it wouldn't be so bad if Monopoly hadn't been so wildly popular and spawned numerous imitators, like this sinister game that I found in a charity shop. This is from 1980, it's called Poll Economy. Players are business tycoons who have to buy up shares and companies and bonds whilst jostling for political power in order to further their financial interests. So what might be called corruption by some people is treated in the game as entirely normal. And there's a reason for this, right? The rule book of the UK edition is designed to look like the Financial Times. So you kind of know where it's coming from. But it's not just a simulation of corporate intrigue. It's actually an example of it. Um, for instance, the game was sponsored by an Australian lobbyist group as a means to teach school children about the free enterprise system. And the New Zealand Stock Exchange was involved in your launch in Auckland and the Libertarian Conservative think tank called the Fraser Institute brought the game to Canada a few years later. In the game, um, you can buy real-life companies that actually pay real money to have an advert print on the board, like PG Tips and Win A Lot Dog Food. Uh, bizarrely, these adverts were sold by uh, unemployed stockbrokers, um, and the game is credited <laughs> with helping both them and the Fraser Institute survive the early 80s recession. So this isn't even, even a, case, a case of unconscious political assumptions kind of making their way into a game. The International New Right Project that started in the 70s and helped with power factor and Reagan into power was actually using board games to further neoliberalism, which is both ludicrous and quite frightening. 
but not as ludicrous as this Donald Trump game. <laughs> this is a real thing, right? Made in 1989. There he is looking young and fresh faced and possibly even smugger than he does now. And at the top, his tagline is it's not whether you win or lose, but whether you win. It sounds kind of snappy. But it doesn't mean anything, does it? <laughs> <laughs> it means nothing. It's kind of an early example of Tom's trademark style of no nonsense nonsense. He said at the press launch that it would be the game for the 90s, which it wasn't. Um, he also said all his profits would go to charity, which it didn't, by all accounts. So, already at this early stage, he was pulling off a triple combo of a nonsensical slogan a woefully misjudged prediction and a self-serving lie. <laughs> There's actually an advert from the 80s. Should we see that? Let's see if it works. Everything's set for tonight, Mr. Trump. I wonder what Trump's game is this time. Trump's got a new game. Trump's got a new deal. What's your game now? Trump has a new game. What is it? Yeah. Trump's got a new game. Trump's got a new deal. Yeah. What's your game now? Trump has a new game. My new game is Trump, the game, Trump. A game where you deal for everything you ever wanted to own. Because it's not whether you win or lose, it's whether you win. Yes! Play Trump, the game from Milton Bradley. I think you'll like it. Mr. Trump's proceeds from Trump, the game will be donated to charity. I think you'll like it. <laughs> that slogan, at least it makes sense, right? <laughs> Even if it was wrong. It turned out the game bombed massively. It was re released in 2004 with a different smart picture when Trump was on The Apprentice and it bombed again. Um, I don't know how the game works, don't want to. Trump's name is on every card and his face is on every banknote which is kind of off-putting enough. The counters are T-shaped, there's even a T on the bloody dice. Right? <laughs> Time magazine um, included this in the list of Trump's 10 biggest failures and it's featured in a Swedish Museum of Failure, whatever that is. <laughs> so, but it's not whether you win or lose, I'm sure Donald's okay. He's okay with that, because it's not whether you win or lose. But um, it's an, I think it's similar to Monopoly, and, but it's n another game, we've only looked at games that kind of carry this message, and overtly carry this message, but there's a long history of games that have tried to deal with different sort of politics, and it, a straightforward example is Anti-Monopoly. Um, released in 1973, this game is almost literally Monopoly in reverse. Players take on the role of federal caseworkers who are trying to bring indictments against big businesses to break up their monopolies. It doesn't sound that weird, it? and it looks really dull, but what came out of the game is fascinating. Um, in 1974, this is the inventor, uh, Ralph Anstack, who is an American economics professor. He was sued by Parker Brothers for trademark infringement, just by using the word monopoly in the title. What followed was a 10-year legal battle, which is even longer than most games in Monopoly, right? <laughs> and the official history of the game holds that it was invented during the Great Depression by an out-of-work salesman called Charles Darrow, who sold his idea to Parker Brothers and went on to become a millionaire. Presumably, this transaction took quite a while if they paid in single notes. It's not money, mate! Anyway, during the court case, we discovered that Darrell's version of Monopoly was highly derivative of an early game that had been in circulation for decades. Ralph Anspach, um, the inventor of anti Monopoly, learned that the original incarnation of Monopoly had been invented in the turn of the 20th century by a journalist called Elizabeth McGee. She was a progressive feminist who also worked as a secretary and a comedian, a poet and a games designer. McGee was a passionate advocate of Henry George's theory of land value tax and filed a painting in 1903 for a game she hoped would spread the theory. Originally called the Landlord's Game, her invention is actually intended to highlight the evils of the property system. Here's a version of the board from 1906. And it already kind of looks familiar as you go around the square, except you notice there's a poorhouse, free parking is a poorhouse. It wasn't an immediate success, but it kind of filtered through. It got popular amongst kind of progressive circles and universities and Quakers, people like that. Um, over the 30 years, it kind of trickled into the public domain with people making their own versions, changing the rules, and even adapting the name. Charles Dallow. Uh, liked it so much that he made his own copy and sold it to Parker Brothers. So Darrow's Rags to Riches story, which had been passed down by generations of American families as a kind of depression near the parable, 
was a lie based on an act of plagiarism which was aided by an unscrupulous company who continued to perpetrate that lie and it's until the 70s and, and kind of beyond. So it's no surprise that Elizabeth McGee's original message, which was quite a radical message, got lost along the way. In any case, Ralph Anspach did win his legal battle after 10 years. But it's interesting how his game was collective to a game that had originally set out to make the same kind of point, the same, the same kind of political point. So he won his legal battle, but what happened to Parker Brothers? Well, in 1968, the company was acquired by General Mills, merged with toy makers Kennett and later sold to Tonka. In 1991, Tonka was acquired by Hasbro, who had really <coughs> bought out MB games and went on to buy out numerous other companies throughout the 90s. In fact, in 1995, Hasbro even attempted the merger with their biggest rivals, Mattel, who had been busy buying up the other half of the toy games industry. In case that's all a bit confusing, I've made you a helpful flow <laughs> Got that? So, so not only is the public's idea of board games being monopolised by the board game monopoly, but the company that makes monopoly has also tried to monopolise the very word monopoly at the same time as heading towards an actual monopoly based partly on the popularity of the board game monopoly. <laughs> if you want, you can try a drinking game whenever I say popoly. <laughs> There's going to be loads more chances. And that's because no other game spawns so many imitations or parodies. In the same way people kind of change the lyrics of pop songs to subvert or speak the original. People always use Monopoly as a template to overlay different rules onto the game, sometimes for political reasons, political purposes, or just to represent a different lifestyle. For instance, in 1980, a company called Parker Sisters released a uh, game Monopoly now, Game Monopoly shouldn't be confused with the entirely different game, Gayopoly, or even Homonopolis, um, which is either kind of clever Greek wordplay or some kind of gay slang that I don't get. Um, this game has cell phones as playing pieces, because obviously only gay people use mobile phones. <laughs> and in the corner, instead of a jail, it's got a sex dungeon. Go directly to the sex dungeon, do not pass the road. <laughs> anyway, um, Parker Brothers sued Parker Sisters into oblivion. But this one, Homonopolis, uh, got away with it, presumably because the name was so difficult to say. <laughs> <laughs> There's also Bibleopoly, um, in which players help each other build churches. And you can win money by reciting passages from the Bible, which will have made Sunday school a lot more fun. <laughs> Um, worryingly, the train stations in this game have been turned into abyss squares, which is kind of so square. Presumably, the station is not quite so down, you got it. Um, yeah, the train has been delayed for eternity. <laughs> there's also there's a company in America right, that makes custom Opoly games, that's all they do, and they've got a range of hundreds. You can ring them up and say, well, no, an Opoly game about anything. They, they've got Shark Opoly. Um, DIY Opoly, for the dad, uh, Chihuahua Opoly, <laughs> and my favourite, Bacon Opoly. <laughs> um, in this, the street names have been replaced by bacon products of varying quality. <laughs> Old Kent Road is known as Bacon Grease, and as you go around, you can buy bacon vodka, bacon lip balm, and chocolate covered bacon on a stick. This company has uh, managed to find a way to avoid the lawsuit, presumably they've changed the rules ever so slightly, renamed all the trademarks. However, that didn't save a 2003 game called Ghetto Opoly, which was so racist nobody really minded when Parker Brothers moved in to sue. The cards say stuff like, you got your whole neighbourhood addicted to crack, collect like $50. <laughs> Now, I know what you're thinking, $50, that's some pretty cheap crap. <laughs> However, there have been some games that have tried to tackle racism in a sort of genuine way, but haven't always worked. For instance, Blacks and Whites, that came out in 1970, it was published by an American psychology magazine. The game was intended to teach white middle class players about racial privilege, but it did this by making it utterly impossible for the black players to win. Um, the white players start with a million dollars each. The black players um, are prevented from uh, buying the most desirable properties and they're actually banned from certain parts of the board. I might be wrong, it sounds a bit shit, 
<laughs> who wants to, uh, it's kind of a noble aim, but who wants to play a game that they, they can never win? Um, there's a sort of problem with the medium and the message, and the two are totally out of whack. Which is not a problem um, this has, life as a black man, but it clearly has other problems. Although it was invented by a black man, and it kind of does what it says on the garish box, you, um, you, but if you didn't know it, you might think it was a kind of questionable parody, and it might seem a bit dodgy. Um, but luckily I've dug up another TV commercial, so it is actually a real thing. Check out this. Life as a black man is a hot new game that's sweeping through households across America. Life as a black man lets you make important life-altering choices. I'll choose not to commit the crime. Experience real-life obstacles. Fired again, the man is keeping it down. And struggle to attain freedom. Yeah! If it's in life, it's in the game. Grab the ultimate party game that dares you to live life as a black man. I understand. Do you understand now? <laughs> Do you understand? Um, bizarrely, the same guy that made that has made uh, a phone app. So he actually seems in earnest about the game's message. But both this game and Blacks and Whites crop up, crop up on a lot of these internet lists of the most disturbing games ever made. But in both cases, are actually intended to tackle racism in, in a game setting in, a, in this genuine way positive way, which isn't something you can say about this game from Nazi Germany, which is actually quite disturbing. It was made in 1936 and it's called Juden Laus, which translates as Jews out. You win by moving figures to the collection points outside the city to be deported to Palestine and the councils look like this. I think the Jews are the cones that fit on the players' pointy heads, right? Adverts from the time claim this game sold a million copies. Other sources suggest it sold so poorly it was given away, or that there are only ever two prototypes. What we do know is that it wasn't made or even endorsed by the Nazi party. Joseph Goebbels was interested in using board games as propaganda, actually, and he made a, the party made a few during the war, but this one was made by a private German company. In fact, um, the SS weren't even very happy with it. And, um, the people who made it describe it in the rule book as an up-to-date and outstandingly jolly party game for grown-ups and children. <laughs> the Nazi verdict of the game was quite damning though. An SS newspaper at the time said the political slogan Jews out is used here, exploited here as a big seller for toy shops and trivialised as an amusing pastime for little children. The invention is almost a punishable idea, perfectly suitable as grist to the mills of hate of the international Jewish press. Jews out, yes of course, but rapidly out of the toy boxes of our children before they're led into the dreadful error that political problems are solved with the dice cup. So the SS game review, it's interesting the SS have a game review in the newspaper. Um, they were worried that the Nazi cause was too noble to be given this treatment, as if the ideology of the Third Reich was so fragile it could have been toppled by an outstanding new jolly party game. If only we'd known that at the time. <laughs> Would have been would have saved a lot of bother with that war. A similar argument about trivialisation was made by some on the left in 1978 about this one class struggle. Um, it was made by a New York politics professor called Bertel Ullman. Um, what's pleasing about this game is that Ullman looks exactly as you'd imagine a Marxist professor from the 70s in New York to look like. Um, <laughs> Warner Brothers bought the rights to make a film of this guy's life, which is a first for any game designer. Class Struggle with the game itself is a light-hearted attempt to let to sort of map left-wing ideas onto the format of a board game. It tries to make a polemical point in the very first rule. So everyone has a chance uh, to go first. Everyone has a chance to be the capitalist player. But you have to roll the die uh, the luck of birth dice. Um, Everyone has a chance to roll it, but it starts with the lightest white male and goes round to the darkest black female. So your race and gender affects the setup of the game. It's back sort of before you've even started it, it's even segregating you. To point out how unlikely it is people to, to be the ones that actually accidentally end up in a lucky situation. You have just been laid off from work, reads one of the cards. If you blame yourself, 
or foreign competition over blacks or the Jews, move two spaces back. If you blame the capitalists, move two spaces forward. There's also squares like this. Government orders the stocks of all copies of dangerous game, class struggle, and maybe too late to it. <laughs> the government didn't go after Berto Ullman, but he did lose prestigious promotion at his university because conservative uh, journalists kicked up controversy about his politics. He also got endless hassle from salesmen and manufacturers and even got death threats. Another game but in a similar position was this game, War and Terror. This was made by some Cambridge friends in 2006 and it plays a little bit like this, except you can use weapons of mass destruction to meet countries and steal their oil. It also comes with a barracala, which <laughs> players have to wear <laughs> if they become the rogue state, right? It's a satirical game, and it makes a serious point, but it made a lot of people twitchy due to the theme and the timing, which was in, right in the middle of the Iraq War. It was banned at toy fairs, um, it was delayed at customs, it was recalled on, this day of, on, this, on the sort of day of the, the big release. They trashed a load of copies, and it, it, it triggered incendiary headlines like this. It's a sick game, it's a sick Absurdly, a copy was seized by Kent Police at a climate camp demonstration on the grounds that the balaclava could be used to conceal someone's identity in the course of a criminal act. Now, there are many things that can be used to conceal your identity, so presumably it's also legal to have a beard or a hat. Okay? Also, you can buy balaclavas at any army circus shop. And the one in the game has the word evil written on it, which <laughs> presumably makes the police's job easier. <laughs> Despite all that, or maybe because of it, it was a big hit. It's polemical and the, the humour is caustic. But unlike the blacks and whites and the others, it's actually a game you might want to play. It's funny, it's funny. Um, the same company that made this also made a game called Crunch, the game for utter bankers and Trump Trumps. I apologise for showing you, making you look at his face again. Um, so we've seen how the industry has sometimes hindered board games to take a pointedly political approach. I think things might be improving, partly because the nature of gaming has changed so much in recent years. For a long time, board games were either seen as a festive family pastime or an all-consuming hobby for nerdy boys. Um, not saying anything about my younger self there. But nowadays the audience has emerged and morphed to such a point where you know, it's, it's changed a lot to, and to the point where there's sort of trendy gaming cafes opening up, like this one in London, which must have been a nightclub, isn't it? You know, this is what old nightclubs are turning into now, is gaming cafes. Um, at this point in the talk, we've had clever quotes, we've had helpful flowcharts. We want to see a graph. Ooh, the graph has arrived. Uh, this shows the number of new board games that were made every year during the 20th century. Um, completely scientifically accurate, by the way. And as you can see, the demographic shift I was talking about has been accompanied by a huge explosion of games in the last few years. In, there's 5,000 released last year alone. So if political games used to lose out in the fight for shelf space, if this new kind of climate encourages more, it's more likely to foster games that uh, encourage debate and tackle big themes. And there's weird and wonderful titles coming out all the time, like this one, uh, by Graf. Uh, this one, you play a League of Nations delegate, right, who has to broker treaties whilst also escaping from a troop of insane Swiss axe jugglers. <laughs> it's called, oh my god, there's an axe in there. <laughs> I've also found a game called Ideology, the same title as my old college prototype. It's quite a good game, but the box art is awful, so let's zoom in. Uh, I think it's... Um, who have we got here? It's Stalin, I think. It's really hard to tell with this sort of drawing. I think it's Stalin, Ayatollah, Kaiser Wilhelm, Teddy Roosevelt and Churchill. And what I like is the idea that all these, game, all these guys are in the same room together playing a board game. Not just any game, but a game that's all about themselves. Perhaps one day things like this could be used to facilitate conflict resolution amongst world leaders, or at least give them something better to do with their time. We're sort of at the end now, but um, 
I hope I've shown that just as every politician doesn't always lie, cheat and steal, that games don't always have to support capitalism in war. And that you can probe politics without causing an outburst of frustration or aggravation. <laughs> and I'm sorry, but the time's up, so I've got to go. <laughs> So who uh, has a question for Ben? Yes. Ah, Hi Ben. Hi. Do you have any aspirations to make another game yourself? I've got a couple of games on the go. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 Might be. Um, I might do another talk when I've got them. Ah. So if I'm to you, who knows? <laughs> um, they're not necessarily political ones. Right. But maybe I should. Dig out the old prototype and get it working. Oh, yes, okay. And why do you think there's so many games being sold now? What's why, why the spike? I don't know. This lots of people have got different theories about this. I think it seems a bit like board games were dying off in the 90s when yeah. computer games came into the world. It seemed like oh, who wants to play board games anymore? They kind of became quite unfashionable. So something weird happened where. I don't know whether people have decided that actually spending time with their friends, doing something physical, is a nice alternative to being online all the time and looking at a computer screen. But there's definitely and it's more social time with friends. Um, it's possibly tied in with the hipster thing. Lots of these cafes, people like they do really nice craft bales and birds and things. And bizarrely, the, the last type of people that you would expect to be into something so nerdy seem to be the kind of trendy people that are, it's a bizarre, so everything is shifting that, and so it's the computer game people that are maybe reacting against not wanting to spend so much time online, and I don't know, lots yeah, of different shifts. Technology is the analog yeah. revolution that's people doing things vinyl and yeah. It yeah. might be part of that, yeah. yeah. There's a, there's a pub in uh, Hastings called the Albion that have a games night. I think it's every two weeks, and they came up and used yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, they, uh, they, uh, they run a games night and bring their board games and probably, probably get into yeah. it. Yeah. There's two places in Brighton where I live that are dedicated to playing games as well. And they're really popular places. Yeah, yeah a few doors yeah. down, I did yeah. notice it coming. Oh, that's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And the underground theatre does board games as well. It's quite a sociable thing to do. Perhaps not when you're playing these really critical games. <laughs> it might, might cause some debate, but maybe that's a good thing. Like it gives you an angle point to discuss this stuff. Yeah. What sparked your interest in games, and then looking into this aspect of it? Um, I, I guess it's how board games. I've always been interested in games since I was a kid, basically. And it's how politics can be discussed in other ways, like politics and music is something that interests me a lot, and politics and games. It, it seems to have cropped up in the past. There's loads of suffragette games, actually. I've only found that recently, and it, it seems to be something that people turn to a lot, as how can we put this message out, how can we make this part of a discussion. And I realised that a lot of the games that I remembered were just basically make money, there were two types of games, make money or kill people. And you know, those are the messages that kids are getting through the games. I know most kids are probably getting killed people through computer games now, but that's the, the background. I wondered whether it was possible. Because the game's got to have some competitive element, so, which is why I was taking the mick out of that Bioblopoly game, because the players have to work together to build churches to win. So there's something to be said about cooperative game and actually now there are more cooperative games where you're kind of working together to try and beat the rules of the game yeah. so there has to be a competitive element but that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be quite so kind of ruthless and capitalist and warlike in its nature and I wonder whether games could be have a promote a different sort of politics and it seems that there's a long history of this sort of thing going on yeah brilliant any other any other questions can't uh, the, uh which, there's, a, there's a craze now, isn't there? Of um, I, know, I know there's the online gamers, but um, there's a craze of people that don't play the online games. They watch the people playing the online games. Mm -hmm. come across this. <laughs> so it's, it's a huge thing that the. Uh, it's they, the same as the they, they might be. They might well be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
huge, huge, I mean, millions of people just addicted to watching other people play games. Especially play like games. kids nowadays probably watch people play games more than they play games. That's, that's bizarre. That is it. And that's the commentary that goes with them. It's a whole new genre. They've grown up with voyeurism, haven't they? And it seems to be the norm. Well, I think there's, there's channels like Twitch that are dedicated yeah. to online games, and then eSports <coughs> is becoming huge yeah. industry in the world. So that sort of. Yeah. Well, I'm sure that because, yeah. because Twitch is, is a big one, isn't it? Yeah. They spend more time doing that than actually playing the games. So yeah. Yeah. It's not, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. just another form of it. Yeah, I think the, 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 game, the gamers are becoming so huge so that's the thing. Um, right, well, there's no more questions. I will, I will stop there. We'll take another short break. Um, Chat noise. Sorry about that. But otherwise, we would all be dead in here with the heat. Yeah, just right. um, so we'll take a 10-15 minute break. We'll come back uh, 22, quarter two, for our final. Um, <laughs>